Okay, well, I've uh, got the signal from Mr. Abbey, and uh, the next panel is on uh, one-year ISS missions. And it's my pleasure to introduce the panel's moderator, Dr. Jennifer Fogarty, uh, who is on the previous ISS panel. And Jen was recently appointed as the chief scientist of NASA's Human Research Program, uh, succeeding uh, John Charles in this important role. The chief scientist leads the development and oversight of the HRP research portfolio, including collaborations with international partners. So it's particularly pertinent to this summit. Jen is also the contracting officer's representative for the new Translational Research Institute for Space Health, which is the follow-on institute to the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, which ended its 20-year cooperative agreement uh, with NASA in September. So prior to her current positions, Jen was a cardiovascular discipline scientist with Wiley and then moved to NASA where her activities included support for the JSC chief medical officer, uh, Jeff Davis at the time. So this is Jen's first uh, time attending ISMS and uh, we welcome her to the podium. So thanks very much, Jen. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutton. Uh, pleasure to be here. Glad you got more of an introduction <laughs> of who I am. Um, it's exciting. It's a little baptism by fire for the first time you attend to uh, jump into panel membership and moderating. Um, so I've seen there's lots of different styles, so I hope you'll be a little generous with my evolving style on the panel today. So our topic is uh, one-year mission. Uh, clearly, we've completed one one-year mission uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that the Russians have accomplished other one-year missions on, on prior space stations and, and do have knowledge there. You talk about knowledge sharing. Um, so that's probably going to be a, a good part of the, the discussion um, from lessons learned in the past, how we evolve forward. Uh, we have a, a distinguished panel members here, um, some of which I know much better than others. Um, and we're given, I'll say, a small amount of time maybe to prepare for, <laughs> for moderating. So I'm actually going to let them kind of do their intro as they, they give their comments. Um, but I did want to talk about one-year missions in general. There were some, some key points, topics they wanted discussed. Um, I think for the one that we did in terms of science plan and science accomplished, it was a Herculean effort uh, that went on, on on the entire international front um, for Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko to get the science up there. Uh, it was mentioned earlier in the collaborative one. We had the fluid shifts experiments. We had field tests, um, a variety of neurovascular, cardiovascular. Um, but they also are premised, and this is where I thought it was interesting, on medical requirements. Now, in, in our world, in the NASA world, it is not unusual at all for the science, science to leverage off those medical requirements. And maybe some of the comments from earlier today of historical space missions, we have evolved with what we do f with our medical requirements out of even some of the research. So while it might not appear that we've continued some of it, it's just st it become standard operating procedure, particularly in the pre-post mission time frame, t for us to gather a body of knowledge on the crew that help us treat them as individuals as well as do epidemiology and assess what's going on with the population. But the question that prompted the one-year mission was we've become pretty comfortable with six-month missions, the degree of change in the body physiologically, um, psychologically to a degree. Um, but can we really legitimately extrapolate out to much longer durations of exposure? Um, you really need to understand how that system is working to legitimately say, is a 12-month mission different than a six-month mission? Will the curve between the two pieces of data that maybe you've gathered pre-post look the same? Will it, it maintain a negative slope? How steep will it be? Do we plateau off at some point? And the, the questions that have been asked are to the effect of if we go 24 months, 36 months, where are these systems going? How much bone will be lost? How much muscle will be deconditioned? What will happen to the cardiovascular system? How will the body continue to compensate? How much reserve will there be? So I think we tried to touch on them with the first one-year mission with the vision that there would be more. We went in with a position that there would be a minimum an N of 12. That meant six one-year missions. The concept was always to partner 
um, the crew members together, but it's not absolutely necessary. I think logistically it makes a lot of sense to at least have two people participating in a one-year mission at a time. Um, but we've had to open those discussions again. I know a lot of our policymakers are in the room and representatives from the agencies that say we have to be all in. It's almost a non-starter to think you could do it unilaterally because of the complex nature of station. Um, so actually, I'm going to start off with Dr. Mike Barrett, um, a former flight surgeon, active astronaut, short duration and long duration flyer, uh, and pretty much one of the strongest advocates we have from the life science perspective uh, sitting on the crew office side. Um, he is very well versed, you know, written um, textbooks, articles, journal editor, um, probably one of the, the leaders in the field and um, definitely a mentor in my eyes. So I wanted to open the discussion with Dr. Barrett. Thanks, Dr. Fogarty. It's, uh, it's kind of cool seeing you up there. Doing this. <laughs> um, so what I want to do uh, to make sure everybody has their territory as well is to focus really on the crew perspective. And, and I, I am a, a very strong advocate for human research. As far as the one-year flight program, I'm probably more of a centrist because it's a very polarized community as far as uh, should we be doing these, should we not be doing these, and even should we have done it, should, should we do it. So to be real candid, uh, and I may have shared this at meetings past, it's worth sharing again because the question continues to arise several times a year uh, as to the willingness of crew members to spend a year on orbit. When I did take a break from the astronaut office and uh, became program manager of the human research program, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier uh, from headquarters contacted me and informed me that we would be considering doing a, a one-year mission uh, with two crew members, one US, one Russian. And I had at the time just gotten uh, familiar with the fly-off plan for HRP, which included a whole bunch of six-month missions, uh, and that was going to give us the statistical power that we needed. This was a, a pretty big threat to that, potentially. But there were reasons to do it, uh, and if some of you may remember, the Stafford Commission was almost fanatically supportive of doing something like this because it, it was a step towards exploration, almost a fast-track step. It fell to me to inform the astronaut office of this proposal, and after uh, kind of giving that presentation, there, there were clearly uh, people on both ends uh, of that equation in the office. Uh, but about five people followed me out of the room and said, I want to do this. Uh, individually, uh, astronauts, I think, are very competitive and enjoy challenges, and, and there are motivations beyond just supporting the, the greater altruistic science portfolio. But uh, there's certainly, uh, there was certainly interest at the time, and there continues to be interest by people who would like to spend a year in, in low Earth orbit. Um, and I, I will qualify that by saying a year in low Earth orbit, because that's the platform we have. It is probably a golden age of habitability uh, for low Earth orbit right now. It'll never be better. Real-time communication, the chow is good, the exercise equipment is really good. Uh, it's not hard to spend a year in low Earth orbit, I will have to say, right now. Um, on my 199th day uh, in space, I did not want to come home. Uh, and a lot of us uh, get into a rhythm up there where you can really see yourself continuing. Uh, the countermeasures are good. You're feeling strong. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult to envision spending a year in space. So really, willingness of, of astronauts, participation per se, is, is not a question. Um, now, there, is, there are management issues that's, uh, that balance, that counterbalance that, in that it is important for us to spread out flight experience for many critical reasons, so that we're left at the end of programs with a, as rich and diverse a flight experience as we can to apply to new programs. So, so that is certainly in there. Uh, and again, there, there continue to be polarized views, but, but I don't think it will ever be difficult to find uh, volunteers for the one-year flight. Um, I would also like to point out that uh, this was a forcing function for U.S.-Russian research that we really hadn't seen the likes of since the Phase One program when we started flying the Shuttle Mirror program. Now, you would think, how can that be? Because we had been flying together on the ISS for, for 12 years at that point. True, uh, but the science portfolios had been largely separate. Uh, there was very little joint work going on. And this did become a forcing function to, to bring U.S. and Russian, uh, I should say USOS, uh, other uh, international partners and Russian investigators together on such big, broad projects such as fluid shifts uh, in a way that we really hadn't done before. And that ended up being an extremely healthy thing. It also brought us technologies that we've been trying to bring into the program but didn't really have good, compelling 
reasons to do for a while, such as uh, genomic uh, studies, mostly oriented towards the twin studies, uh, of course. But, uh, but still, what we came out with was much more than just having done the one-year <laughs> flight. But having done the one-year flight, you can look a program manager in the eye and say, not that we, we think we can do it, but we did it. We flew two people. We showed that you can preserve bone and muscle pretty well. Then, and they, they come out pretty good. It's not that hard to envision a year of deep space crews to and from Mars, given this experience base. And so it was really useful. Now it's an N of one or two, however you look at it. Uh, so how powerful is it? Not as powerful as, as 12 souls. Uh, so that's why we think about doing more. Uh, and I think the final point I'll make here is that being one year crew members was not the primary role of Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko. Uh, they were workers. They had to turn the wheel and pound the hammer just like the rest of the crew members. The expectation right now for people on space station is that you are extremely productive and you're extremely busy and you're working out the science portfolio every day. You're fixing things, you're doing spacewalks, and you're doing science almost all day, every day. We didn't cut these guys extra slack. I think we gave them a few extra holidays. Uh, but not much more than that. And so, you know, not only do we prove you can preserve people, uh, but we prove that you can be a productive worker for nearly a year in yeah. flight. And, and again, the expectations are high now, higher than they've ever been as far as what we expect for, for worker productivity. And, and I think they both did a, a terrific job. I'm not saying you don't pay a penalty for being up there. And, and I think we all know that there are some penalties that we pay. Uh, but as far as the fitness of the person to perform the mission during that time period, I think we demonstrated that quite nicely. So I will leave that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you're seeing some results come out now. There should be publications within the next couple of months. Those teams are working hard. It was really actually a minimum of three years of science. I say one year in space. Um, the pre-flight BDC began about a year out, collecting data on the individuals. Then you had the year of the mission itself, just under a year they came back. And then we wanted to watch post-flight recovery, or it was part of the design of the science, uh, which would have been in March of 2017, would have been the one-year anniversary of their landing. So at this point, all of the samples are in hand. And often, we have some of our PIs represented, Dr. Scott Smith I invited on the panel. They do their analysis in batch, so they really do wait for the final sample to arrive before they're going to run the analysis. So uh, while it can be frustrating for people looking from the outside of when this data is going to come out, when's this data kind of going to come out, um, it's probably on the verge. There were some preliminary results discussed at the 2017 investigator workshop in Galveston, which I think you know made some headlines. There were some preliminary findings, which are very interesting. but. It, it, in its totality will still only be an N of two at most. Um, and while every person's experience is important, it's very challenging to say any one person represents what's applicable to everybody. And it's a pretty diverse group in, in the crew office, especially even internationally. We talk about the cultural implications. Um, so next I would ask uh, Dr. Stephen Gilmer, who's the flight surgeon for the one-year mission for Scott Kelly. Uh, he most recently was the representative back to the human research program from space medicine, which is a critical tie. Um, we're trying to push, there, you'll often hear, and Dr. Kondrates up in the audience, of this technology or information push-pull. And you find when someone has a problem and they see a solution, they're really good at grabbing that solution and bringing it in. I want that. It's going to solve my problem. Go acquire it for me. However, when you're on the side of development and you're coming up with new, better ways of doing business or new insights, you're really trying to push that to the other side. And they can look at you very skeptically and think, I don't think so much. I need that right now. Um, so you have to do a lot of, a little bit of salesmanship provide the rationale, but also very much so provide the benefit. Where is the value added? What are you giving me that's better than I had before and why? Um, and sometimes it ends up, while it could be equally as effective for the individual, it's much more time efficient for the program. It could be much lighter and leaner. We have all kinds of operational constraints when we fly hardware. Um, we want to be integrated into the vehicle. We don't want to be the doctor in the box, as they call them, the laptop, the band-aids, the ibuprofen. For most of our equipment, we want to be thought of as a vehicle system because the human is at the center of all of those systems pressing on them. So Dr. Gilmer, we appreciate your insights about being the flight surgeon for the one-year mission. Thank you. Um, certainly was a, a privilege for me to um, serve uh, Scott in that capacity. Um, <clears throat> It's also um, interesting uh, 
because I had the opportunity to support him on a prior six-month mission, and I think um, you've talked a little bit about it, but probably one of the things that's frustrating for our technical colleagues is, you know, our, a physician can kind of give a qualitative assessment of how someone did relative to one event versus the other, and, and part of this was trying to learn um, is there going to be twice as much impact on body systems um, as a result of having been up there for a year? So it was it was nice to have that um, prior experience to compare Scott's um, entire mission to actually, um, and it, it, obviously it's the, just the first um, of attempt at this. Um, so that also makes it a, an additional uh, complication for drawing some conclusions about that, but I, th I think we got a lot of good data. Th the other thing I wanted to expand a little bit on um, was something that Dr. Barrett mentioned was, um, you know, I've been, Im I've been impressed uh, about the um, research that we're now doing um, both on station and in the field. I think you can um, find some videos, for example, of the crew members doing testing that's fairly sophisticated. Um, and, you know, within about a half an hour of landing. Um, so the, those are kind of can give you an example of um, the type of stuff that um, the research community is able to bring to bear. Um, and and what the, the relationship that we have with um, the research program from taking our operational experience, I, I've been impressed um, over the 15 years or so that I've been working um, for the program for NASA. Uh, that if we are able to um, identify, uh, make observations, let me say, about crew members um, and things they're experiencing, um, they're, they're pretty promptly able to bring um, studies um, to help provide a qualitative assessment of, the, of, of that observation, not just the quantitative ones that physicians are typically able to provide. Um, and so I, I thought uh, those things are a couple things that stuck in my mind from this, from that experience. Thank you. One follow-up question for you, because it was a long haul for you as a flight surgeon too. Um, you know, and it had been mentioned before in the prior discussion about relationship between uh, the ground and the crew. But in this case, we don't always look back at the ground as them needing slightly different support. Was there anything you noted from your experience that, from a ground perspective, you thought could have been done a little differently, a lesson learned? Um. I, th I think what I um, what I would say there is um, it, it was it was interesting. Well, there, there's there's many phases of the of the mission, right? There's um, um, getting through the qualifications and launch, and then executing the mission, and then rehab when they come back. Um, I I, th I think. There's probably some um, institutional learning that would be valuable. Um, I could give a few examples of just how, um, since since I was primarily interacting with Scott from the medical capacity, um, you just notice, you know, I, I like to use the, the 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 stories about like don't talk about the Astros game or the football game because I want to watch it myself kind of stuff. And there's other dynamics of our interaction that um, I. They weren't bad. I just I, I didn't really notice them on on the prior six month mission. You just we didn't count the time away. We didn't talk about the weather and, and things like that because um, um, so so that was kind of interesting. I, I didn't anticipate some of those things. Um, I th I think um, the other thing um, and I've seen I've seen it some in the six in crew members that are supported for six month. But uh, Scott was um, pretty. Um, I think he was pretty um, expressive about or telling people about what, what what the experience was like for him physically and what he felt like. Um, and so I, th I think there's there's some musculoskeletal stuff um, just because you're not using the body in the same way in space that when you get back, um, um, you, you do have to spend some time and pay attention to making sure that you're not um, overdoing it. So there's a few things there, I thought. Yeah, and it's been interesting since we didn't have more one-year missions immediately planned and rolled out. 
that these two participants would be easily identifiable, right? You, you went in with the idea that your privacy could not be protected, essentially, if we were going to work this data and discuss it publicly. And so I, I think Scott has really engaged in that, <laughs> clearly um, been very vocal, wants it to be lessons learned. So um, we have not had a lot of issues, but it's still challenging our innate senses to be protective of them as individuals and try to merge it into the group or the end number, and that's just not possible at this point. Our next uh, panel member is Dr. Gushin from the Institute of Biomedical Problems, uh, one of our Russian counterparts on the research side. So I'd like to hear your comments on the one year, Mr. Dr. Gushin. I hope I was invited because uh, there were a little bit more than joint studies which were presented, not just one. We had some other extent of cooperation estab established during MICE 500 with my American colleagues sitting there. Thank, thank uh, them very much uh, because uh, actually, you know, there are always two, two sides in any event. Before we heard about bright side, there is another one. And uh, this side is that for Russians, uh, it was not a problem uh, to fly more than one year. I hope you know that uh, despite some slogans, the longest flight belongs to our country. And it's more than 400 days. And it was many years ago. And it was a member of our institution, Valery Polikov. And I want to say that his flight was really brilliant from the point of view of countermeasures, first of all. And that means that we didn't expect anything bad or negative. And uh, despite Mike said that one, 190 uh, is nothing, that means one year is nothing. First of all, it was not one year. It was 340. Uh, secondly, I'm not sure that it was that smooth as the flight of Polikov, which occurred uh, much before. And that means that we did not make a big step forward from the point of view of countermeasures. So, but it must be, but it didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't happen. Thirdly, I'm not sure that we cannot extrapolate this result to the future. From the scientific point of view, two persons, that's something uh, very individual. And again, this is individual because the flight of Polikov was more smooth. And uh, that's the first thing I want to stress. One flight is not enough. It's a big victory from the point of view of organization. Very big. But from the scientific point, uh, I think that's not nothing, but that's something that poses more questions than giving you answers. Uh, second thing that like our cooperation with American colleagues was based not on the rules of the game, like we discussed a couple of sessions before, but because of the good relationship established during Mars 500. I knew the protocols of my colleagues, so I managed to explain to the people who are doing the flight on our side what they're going to do. But what if not? What if we did not make that international crew before and did not establish that level of trust and cooperation before the flight? I am not sure that these uh, American studies could be success. Maybe yes, maybe no. So it's more personal and individual once again. Thirdly, uh, it's a very nice example of deprivation effect. We are discussing bones and muscles. Mm, OK, they are trained. They can fly longer. They can do some physical work. But do not speak about astros. This is deprivation. That means <laughs> that I, I, I'm really, really miss astros and everything I lost there. And it's not only American astronaut as 
uh, his partner said uh, about two months before landing, I want, what do you want mostly? I want to swim. And he repeated that many times. It's another kind of deprivation. It's really, he needs that sense of touch, of water, and that movement. He also missed some food, despite they had very good food. And uh, it's a contradiction. The, they all, uh, all the time mentioned that the food is very good and tasty. But still, you miss something. Is it easy to miss something if you cannot get that? They can. They were resupplies. But in the autonomous flights, there will be no resupplies. So the deprivation effect could increase. So is it so easy? Finally, um, if we try to think about interplanetary mission and referring to this particular flight, I absolutely support, the Russians need to support each other now, yeah? You understand why? Because of the international situation outside. Many of my colleagues couldn't come because they couldn't get the visas. Okay, let's postpone it. But I want to support Inessa saying that field test must be much more discussed than any other study from the annual flight when the astronaut, after the flight, cannot move, cannot do simple operations, that means that after landing on the moon, he will not be able to operate. And we do not know how long and what countermeasures are necessary. His bones and muscles will be OK. What about performance, which is much more important we are not just sending organisms, we are sending people. And therefore, I think that, again, more questions were posed than the answers received. And uh, if some people are satisfied, as a scientist, I am not. And I'm looking forward for continuation of cooperation. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-on? Sure. That are you looking forward to more one-year flights? No, I am looking forward for more joint experiments where we can compare data and where we can work on the protocols uh, uh, focused on the problems of the interplanetary uh, of the interplanetary flight, not the orbital flight, but interplanetary flight, like field test is, for example. Yeah, I think when Anessa mentioned field test um, is another good example of collaboration, but it was one of those that was directly applicable to exploration, because right now we do scoop the crew up, you know, 100 plus people at landing to ensure their safety, um, and we all know there won't be a greeting committee on Mars. Um, but to your point, Dr. Gushin, the data we have gathered, while it, it pushed many more questions out there, it also alerted the operational community to the real limits. I think those are often um, not as uh, publicized. You know, we do want to, these are national heroes coming back. You know, they're carried off as such. And then when you try to talk to the people building vehicles and operational systems within those vehicles, they see those same images. And they forget that maybe that person couldn't walk away or um, their motion sickness was so bad they couldn't ingest fluid and they're getting more and more dehydrated. So, so to try to explain those details to the operational side, it says when you land, if we don't have a different way of doing business, this crew will have to take care of themselves or the vehicle will have to care for them for an amount of time. I think what was interesting with um, the data that preceded field tests from Anessa's work, Bill Pulaski's work, uh, Mel Rushke's work, Jacob Bloomberg, was that the difference between shuttle, which was short duration, and ISS long duration, even for six months, was there's a 24-hour lag. So the recovery was within R plus zero landing day for shuttle. They could even walk around the vehicle. You've seen that at Kennedy. Um, but when we get them back now, it's the R plus one time frame. And they recover within about 24 hours to do, you know, basic things to maintain their own well-being, eating, drinking, standing with assistance, but that it gets better and better. So often Dr. Pulaski refers to it as the tincture of time. But operationally, how do you provide that time? 
You know, that is a very expensive thing on a vehicle system to design in, so they want the human to be more robust. So our job is to figure that out, and we're still working on it, because as you said, we have about 100 more questions <laughs> and not many more answers. So moving on to our next panel member, um, Dr. Letty Vega. Um, she actually is a graduate of Rice with her PhD. She's a member of the Baker Policy Institute, so she may be a familiar face to you, but she's actually relatively new to HRP, about a year. She is our Associate Chief Scientist for International Collaboration. Um, Letty has come in and just uh, embraced the role, been to many of the international forums. You might have met her before you, of course, have met me. Um, but we've actually charged Lady to keeping this conversation alive about one-year mission with our international partners across the board. So I'd like to hear your perspective, Lady. Thank you, Dr. Fogarty. Um, just a bit of an introduction. Uh, I've been at NASA for about 19 years. Uh, the first 17, I spent in JSC's engineering community uh, developing next generation uh, life support hardware. So I was very I'm glad to hear what Dr. Fossum talked about, the problems with the Thetlist system when ISS was first built. Um, after that, I joined HRP um, as the Associate Chief Scientist for International Collaborations. Um, so I'm new to HRP, so I'll let my colleagues, other colleagues, on the panel talk about the, the past one-year mission um, and their experiences with it. Um, what I will focus on is uh, what HRP is proposing as a follow-on, and that's a series of additional uh, one-year missions with corresponding six-month and six-week taxi missions. Um, Dr. Barrett talked a little bit about the concern from the Astronaut Corps about these one-year missions, and uh, one, of those, uh, one of those concerns is about the lack of ability to fly, the availability ability of flight, flights um, for astronauts if we have just solely one-year missions. There's also the uh, issue of having enough um, subjects in this pool to make a statistical um, judgment on various countermeasures and various effects of spaceflight on uh, physiological and psychological factors. So what we have proposed is actually doing a series of, of missions. Uh, a, our standard six-month missions where we have our astronauts go up for six months and we have a body of knowledge with that. We have our one-year missions, so 10 additional one-year missions where we look, um, look at the changes in um, crew members over a one-year period of time, adding to that database from Kelly and Korianko, and also leveraging the data from our Russian colleagues that have a number of, of long-duration missions uh, on their, behind their belts as we would like to say in the US. In addition, and also to give, kind of to br bridge that six month and one year missions, we'll have a series of six, 10, six week ta 10 six week taxi missions. So we would have 10 crew members that are at six weeks, 10 crew members that are at six months, and 10 crew members at one year. So that provides us a statistical body of data to look at both the chronic, um, the common, and the long term effects of space flight. And to utilize that data um, as basically a set of data that we can look at for the one-year shakedown mission as part of the gateway um, project that Mr. Gersten Meyer has proposed. And as part of that, in the late 2020s, there will be a one-year shakedown mission in the cislunar orbit. So we'd like to use that data that we've gathered from these upcoming one-year missions and use that to uh, validate our countermeasure development for this shakedown mission. Uh, in addition to these, uh, our standard measures, um, these are standard uh, biological and biochemical tests that we will be collecting on the astronauts over a period of time uh, for all of these missions. In addition to that, we are also releasing an international solicitation to look at the changes, psychological and physiological changes over time. Um, for these various one-year missions. And that solicitation will be an international solicitation, so we're inviting our international colleagues to participate in this, not only participate as crew, potential crew members for this one-year mission, but also participate in the science and in the data sharing with regards to that. And we are looking both at the uh, physiological and psychological effects. So what we, the goal of this at the end of this mission is to have a wide body of data to look at the changes of humans over a long period of time, and then also look at countermeasure developments and identify any potential new countermeasures that need to be developed. Thank you. The next person on the panel that I asked to come in to give a little different perspective from one, another one of our international partners was Dr. Guillaume Wirtz, uh, representing the European Space Agency. Um, Dr. Gertz comes to us via STEC. So, uh, 
<laughs> prior <more>. life, <laughs> <laughs> but representing medical operations, Dr. Wirtz. Yeah, um, so I'm working for, for the European Space Agency, where I'm not only leading the, uh, the space medicine office, but <coughs> also uh, the way ESA is organized. I'm in charge of the ESA Medical Board, which is also reviewing and approving all experiments to which our crew members are participating. Um, and that's probably on this aspect I would like to focus. Independently from the approach that our program has, can have about uh, one-year missions, um, when I, if I were faced with, uh, with the request to have uh, an ESA crew member participating into a one-year mission, I would probably try to evaluate what is actually the, uh, the risk-benefit ratio of such a mission. Um, there are there are, uh, medical, uh, there are different ways to, to look at that. There is, first of all, the, uh, the adequation bet between the, the, the one-year mission and what we are trying to look at. If we, the objective is to look for interplanetary mission, I, my uh, colleague, colleague uh, was mentioning before, uh, is the mission profile ad uh, adequate? Is the mission duration also representative of what we are looking at? Um, I would also like to, to look at uh, the medical risks. Uh, we know that um, by handing people one year on, in space, we are also consuming their radiation capital. <laughs> and that's something which is also to, has to be considered in the career of the astronauts. Uh, second aspect is that we know there are some pathologies which are now appearing in uh, even in six, year, six months missions that we do not know exactly how that can <laughs> impact a one-year mission and the, the further career of the astronaut. I'm talking about the VIP, by example. So uh, all that are really creating some ethical questions and which are quite predominant in the way to evaluate such missions. And uh, is, uh, we can very legitimately ask the question, what is better efficient or best <coughs> efficient to look for more long duration or more duration for the experiment, or if we want to have more subject. And I would like to, return, to turn a, uh, around the argument that you were using, which is mm -hmm. it's pretty much difficult to justify a one-year mission or the repetition of a, of a one-year mission because we want to see if that's significant, 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 sorry, significant or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we don't have a good evaluation of what is actually the justification of this mission first. So do, what is what we, what we look for uh, really something that we will find in such a mission? So at the end, uh, for me, if I had to evaluate such a mission or such a request, uh, what I would probably look at, uh, look at is what kind of ref red flag criteria can we define? How where can we justify actually this mission? What kind of experiment will actually give the answers that the questions that we ask? And first of all, what are the questions that we want to ask? So. Thank hmm. you. You know, and I do think um, to your point of risk benefit ratio, that is something that I think comes up commonly. Um, definitely in the realm of what we call our institutional review board, pr uh, previously our committee for the protection of human subjects. That concept that the data you're going to gather and how you're going to gather it far as outweigh the, the risk of what you're doing presents. Um, so, but that is an interesting conversation at the at the highest level of the concept of a one-year mission. I think in low Earth orbit, we definitely thought we were well within our risk boundary. Um, we often use the ability to return people back to Earth quickly if needed to. I understand there's a lot of political capital and expense in that decision, but they are capable of returning to Earth within hours. Um, right now on the table is potentially doing that in cislunar in preparation for Deep Space Gateway. Uh, then the return is um, uh, several days, um, depending on the plan, and so that starts balancing out what would you have done and what is it you're looking for? Um, we try to use a balance of both what the medical community gathers today with respect to finding those red flags, but we also know that um, a lot of the changes to your point about VIP or SANS is that they're subclinical, and you're trying to keep your eye on subclinical changes that are preceding clinical, and you really want to be able to intervene before you get to a point of something is clinically relevant or pathological? Could you have steered this thing a different way? Or, you know, the, the idea of do no harm, you may need to watch it. You may not, intervening too soon or in the wrong way could be a worse hazard. So, I mean, that's part of, I think, the discussion to be had about any one of the 
experiments or um, what it is, is that's driving you toward that, that experimental paradigm. Um, so our next, it's a good segue into our next panel member that I asked to be on the panel is Dr. Scott Smith. Um, he is our preeminent subject matter expert in nutritional biochemistry at Johnson Space Center, collaborates broadly internationally, um, has some of the most robust end numbers known to space flight research at this point. <laughs> um, so definitely been part of this gray space that we often walk between occupational surveillance and research and when we're trying to transition data from one paradigm to another or inform the operational community of maybe what should be watched from an occupational perspective or a medical perspective. Um, Dr. Scott participated in both the one-year mission and the twin study, which is inextricable from it, but slightly tangent to. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Scott Smith and uh, have him comment on the one-year mission, both the past and the future. Thanks, Dr. Fogarty. Again, as, as Dr. Fogarty mentioned, I'm a nutritional biochemist. And to that end, we look at both nutritional biochemistry and our, the medical work that we do, the operational testing that we do from a nutrition perspective, we do before and after flight for obvious reasons. And when the Human Research Program was born back in 2005, one of the things that came about at that same time was the ability to collect, uh, process, and freeze biological samples on board station. And they came to us, in essence, and said, what would you do with that? And we said, well, we have a lot of data before and after flight. We don't know what happens during flight. And if something's changed at landing, if we see a decrement in foliage status or vitamin status or mineral status at landing, we don't know how that change occurred. And what we need to do is collect samples during flight to be able to look at the time course of those changes. And we were, we were granted access uh, to start one experiment that we call the nutrition study, and we eventually evolved that into um, a study that's ongoing now that we call the biochem profile. Um, and we've had tremendous access to crew. Um, and uh, I say that as if it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and uh, one of the things we've learned from that is that it's great to look at groups. It's great to look at the average and see what the deviation is around the mean uh, and see what those responses are to space flight. Um, but when you boil it down, you've got to look deeper than that. And you look at individual responses. And, and you, there really are individual responses to what's going on. And I lead all that as a, as a preamble to the one-year mission, which is we were very excited to have the opportunity to study Scott Kelly um, on this one-year mission, to be part of the twin study, which was a, a much more extreme look at um, an, an individual on a 12-month mission. Um, and while, as has been said before, there's not a lot of the data that we can release yet, because with one crew member um, participating, anything I tell you is obviously identifiable. Um, we have shown some data in public. We have gotten permission to show data. Um, and one of the intriguing things I'll tell you is that um, we did see some striking changes in the back half of his mission. Um, the other intriguing aspect of this is that we were also able to study Scott on his six-month mission. So we have two sets of data on him that we can compare. And looking at things like weight loss, which occurred during flight, um, and how that, uh, how that continues or gets worse, again, in the back half of the mission um, is striking. How dietary changes uh, occur over the course of the mission um, and what impact that has on, on different changes. Um, and looking at that, it really is um, striking how that individual responded. Um, and what that does is it tells you that, indeed, we flew a one-year mission, indeed, there were biochemical changes that we, that we noticed, uh, subclinical changes, again, that were mentioned before, um, that lead you to, to have concerns, changes that you can measure during flight that you can't see in post-flight testing, for example. All those things, uh, I think, bear on the fact that we need to study more individuals. We need to look longer term. We need to look at individuals flying on repeat missions, which we've had um, a few of them, but clearly not, not enough to make broad sweeping conclusions about. Um, and, and that is, you know, one year missions are the next time hack of how does the body adapt to these longer flights and, and what do we need to do to deal with that. 
from a nutrition perspective, one of the things we hear from crews all the time is that um, the, the menu gets very boring, that the food is very good in and of itself, but that when you repeat the menu cycle every eight days, um, I, I don't care if you pick your eight favorite meals of steak and lobster um, and whatever else, you eat that enough times and you know that Tuesday's always steak day, um, you get pretty tired of steak, as hard as that sounds. Um, one, of the, one of the difficulties on station is that we avoid that to a degree. Every time there's a cargo vehicle, we bring up fresh fruits um, and fresh vegetables. One of, the, one of the unique aspects of Scott's flight was that because he had been there before, because he was going to be there longer, um, the crews get a small, a small amount of preference foods that they can pick for themselves. And Scott said before the flight, I don't want to pick the, the back half until I've been up there. And he called those down um, from the middle of his mission. So he had the ability to realize what he really missed and what he really wanted to make that correction for the second half of the flight. A crew on a Mars mission is not going to have that ability. A crew on a Mars mission is not going to get fresh fruits and fresh vegetables every month, every two months. Um, the impact of those things on psychology, on behavior, on performance, on crew cohesion, on nutritional status um, are still big open questions that we need to deal with. Um, and just, that, just that the fact that one crew member could or couldn't do it um, is by no means uh, an open of the gate to uh, we can send everybody off on, on this type of journey. Thank you, Dr. Smith. A uh, quick question for you. You know, we talked about, you mentioned the frozen samples. Um, <clears throat> do you have uh, a comment or any kind of position on increasing the amount of in-situ analysis capability? Our prior panel talked about, you know, increasing utilization of ISS, and um, that's been one of mine. I know we had made a decision, I guess, or the logistical management of frozen samples down, but there's some limitations with that. Do you want to comment quickly before we open it up to the, the group? Well, in situ analysis has been, uh, has always been, I suppose, the unicorn at this point, that as long as I've been at NASA, we've always been looking for that thing that we could fly that would allow us to analyze <clears throat> chemistry during flight. Um, and there are very limited um, techniques that will allow that now. We're obviously going to need that on a, on a a true exploration class mission um, for two reasons. One is that we'll need the answers sooner than um, after the crew gets home. Um, and the other is even if we could collect samples and freeze them on a Mars mission, um, that the freezer is going to get full very quickly. Um, and my guess is the freezer for blood samples is going to be much smaller than the freezer uh, or than the container for rock samples um, that folks are going to want to bring back. Um, but on station, uh, at this point, uh, the ability to freeze samples and to bring them home um, on cargo vehicles, be it SpaceX or the shuttle before it, um, has worked very, very effectively um, and has, has allowed us to work around from the fact um, that we don't have the in-situ capability that we would like. Um, you, again, at this point, we have some, some very modest um, clinical analyzers um, or some very complex devices that uh, we've seen crews do, do DNA analysis on orbit. Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a whole world in between those things of looking at things like broader biochemistry, um, endocrinology, and those types of markers that you're going to want to look at to see what's going on with bone metabolism so that you know whether or not the, the pharmaceutical you're giving is working effectively, or whether or not the exercise countermeasure that you're doing is working effectively. Um, so that, that remains one of the big gaps that we have moving forward. Thank you. I do agree it has a gap. So we'd like to open up to the floor to the audience. Um, maybe wake up everybody after lunch. I might start calling on people. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, Dr. Dindis, thanks. yes. Over here. Um, thanks very much, panel. So uh, I've long, uh, over the years, interacted with NASA. Uh, <clears throat> it's always seemed a little different for me when interacting with any of the other federal, federal agencies for which we might be doing research, and partly because the going in assumption was you'll find the right people to go into space, they'll go into space, and then you'll measure them over time, 
and you'll see which ones need more countermeasures, mm -hmm. and you'll fix that, and all will be well. So the emphasis has been on time and mission, when in fact, it looks more and more, not just in space, but on Earth, like in this room, we are walking around with differential amounts of vulnerability, genetically and in and, and, and other ways determined, uh, to all kinds of diseases and illnesses. So even if we all ate the same food and had the same lovely environment and got paid the same and lived in the same neighborhoods, et cetera, we're probably all gonna die at different times for different reasons and get different diseases. The between subject variability is consistently larger than the within. And so the question becomes, how do we, and, and then if it's stable over time, it's phenotypic. Mm. And we can measure that, and there's a statistic for that, the ICC, and we know how much variance is stable. We can do twin studies and show that that really is stable, not that NASA's gonna do twin studies in space, at least not probably monozygotic twins or homozygotic. But the question is this, if we're seeing changes in crew members biologically in any system, um, maybe it's important for us to run that same individual again and see if that's a stable response and how much of it is phenotypic and then make a decision about whether they should be in space or whether you can mitigate it. And if you use the one year mission and combine it with six month missions, I'm trying to, trying to be efficient sitting here thinking about this conversation. So that you had crews that, and Scott did this, right? He, he was on a six month mission and then he went on a one year mission. You could calculate an ICC potentially depending on when you got the measurements in space flight for the first six month mission to the second. Now you can't win an N of one, so that's silly, but you could do it if you had enough astronauts. You could start to build up the database. This doesn't, this may seem silly to people who've never done it. I work in the area of human sleep deprivation. We put people through sleep deprivation from mild to very serious. In controlled labs, we measure very precisely their physiologic and cognitive reactions. And there are changes with sleep deprivation. But the standard deviations get larger and larger as the deprivation goes on. And when you strip that out, what you see is some people are deteriorating at an extreme rate, and that's a brain-based deterioration. Others are showing no deterioration. And then there's a group in the middle. And they're not like 5% on the ends, they're about thirds, they're tertiles. Mm -hmm. Which means what's really valuable is to identify up ahead of time who's carrying what vulnerability and how would, uh, and how would we mitigate the optimal people going forward, and frankly, don't fly the most vulnerable people until we understand how to reverse that vulnerability. So that's a little bit of a speech, but it's a way of t thinking differently about this idea and trying to understand whether these changes we're seeing are phenotypically stable or not, and then are they mitigatable or not, or do we have to skip over people who carry those differences? And I know selection is a poison word, but the truth of the matter is that we are in the age of phenotypic, genotypic variation, and we might as well confront it straight on because it's now the basis model for disease, too. Uh, may I? Uh, David, uh, to, to be absolutely honest, uh, most part of Russian astronauts, they participated in several flights. For example, now, uh, for example, now we're having Sergei Ryzansky. It's his second flight. Before, it was Malenchenko and the other guys, the fifth flight, fourth flight. What is different? It's not just mission duration. The scope of operations and events is different. So still, from the point of view of pure science, uh, we can't say for sure because uh, the events during one mission, for example, night uh, wake ups because of the alarm system uh, or some other events like EVAs, they're different. So. Again, the problem with the classical approach to the space medicine data is that we will never have that guinea pigs in astronauts. That's why I mentioned a lunar uh, base or lunar settlement, because there we can have it. But uh, uh, speaking about the events and health deteriorations, Unfortunately, if you have one in flight, you will never fly again. So you cannot reproduce it and, or check it in the other flight. Uh, 
uh, and again and again. Uh, what are the questions or the red flags, as my distinguished colleague from France is mentioning? Uh, I don't think that this is radiation, by the way. We will never expose uh, real people to that level of radiation which we can foresee uh, without the protection, yes? So forget about radiation for a while. But the first thing is duration. Second, landing and operations on the planet. That's why I mentioned uh, uh, the field test as a, an important step forward. Thirdly, as resupplies, and as my colleague is speaking, uh, if you're eating the same food for one month or three months, this is nothing. If it's longer, it becomes a strong, strong factor. At the end, you feel deprivation, and in Mars 500, our Chinese subject was feeling serious stress just before, because of food. So, if we look at the resupplies, uh, you have to see what they really get. If they get just calories or fresh food, and if they get something that can uh, protect them from deprivation, like gifts from home or some, uh, some other things or items that can make their life easier. And finally, it's communication delay that we can foresee. And uh, if we think about these factors in particular, investigate them, not all the factors in the future missions, and do it together, probably we'll have some answers. But again, one step is not enough. One step is just for administration and papers. We have to make a long trip together, uh, make it uh, meaning that we have some roadmap with some uh, focal points where we have to be all, all together again with the same understanding and then at the end probably probably we'll find the answers and from that point one year mission is good and bad altogether so i'd like to uh, point out that um Dr. Smith and Dr. Gengis um, kind of talked about uh, in a more detailed aspect is what is normal and how normal is not this, uh, as we think, is this bell curve of just average in the middle and we have extremes at both ends. Normal is going to be something completely different when it comes to human health and performance. And we're at the very beginning of trying to understand what that normal is, not only for here on Earth, for humans on Earth, but also within space flight itself. So I think part of the part of the goal of this our upcoming mission is to identify what that normal is, and and to identify that. So yeah. So let me undo what I just said in light of what <laughs> you said. So what's the weakness to my argument? Well, what if these phenotypic differential vulnerabilities vary markedly from person to person? Mm -hmm. So you may have a, a terrific resistance to radiation. Right but you're highly vulnerable to microgravity. That's the weakness. I didn't say it, nobody brought it up, but that is the weakness to the argument. And then is it really worth trying to type every person or should we just leap to trying to use the countermeasures? So I think that's, that's the space we're trying to figure out. Well, let, let me just make one comment and turn it over to Dr. Vanderplu. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, identifying phenotypic variabilities, vulnerabilities, if you will. You map those to a genotypic predictor of some sort. Is that a dirty word, selection, et cetera? And I just want to comment that we're not afraid of that uh, because you need to fly informed. And that's on the individual level, the cadre level, and the agency level, so you know what risk you're taking. So I, I would say that we, we, need, we must do that. Uh, we need to know what we're dealing with, and maybe it will uh, add, add into selection, I'm not sure, but that's flying informed. Uh, thanks. Uh, qu my question, uh, I think, probably goes to you, Mike, uh, and Steve, and uh, to everyone. Um, <clears throat> what degree of, of psychological variability do you see uh, uh, with longer and longer flights? Everybody has their happy days and their grumpy days, and food makes a difference, and your menu makes a difference. What kinds of, of variability did you observe, or do you expect to observe, and what kinds of things do we need to think about um, to support the psychological aspect of, of healthy living for um, these extended duration types of missions? 
So you've asked a question with a really big answer, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of dispersion uh, for different individuals and different crews' psychological needs. Uh, Dr. Gushin is much more a holistic expert on that. I can just tell you my own observations as a, as a flight surgeon, as a former deputy chief of the crew office, and as a, as a flyer. Um, we had a very cohesive crew on board, and everyone got along well. We ate together twice a day, every day, with very rare exceptions. And, uh, you know, it's not like we didn't have little arguments once in a while, but uh, we really liked hanging out. Uh, the testament to that is when we got together after flight, we still liked hanging out together and eating some of the same bloody food. Um, <laughs> and believe it or not, cans of Russian food showed up at our post-flight parties. Um, so that tells you maybe how pathological. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially the, uh, the lamb stew is just amazing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was kind of surprised in some ways to find out after that 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 really wasn't the norm on subsequent flights. We were the first uh, plus up to six crew members, and, and that was very different from then. Um, so what I can tell you is that the, the character, the psychological character of the astronaut office uh, has changed dramatically over maybe the last two decades. It's, it's a little bit older, very much more tolerant of unusual environments, partly because we select it, partly because we train it, uh, and partly because we prepare people for those types of expectations. What that does is get us caught up to where our Russian colleagues have been for many, many decades. Uh, but the point being, we, we have a good feel right now for what the predictors are, what the preparation is needed, and some of those countermeasures and, and how they work, and more importantly, in interpreting the response to those. You can tell who's going to have some issues and who's, who's not, or who's going to percolate and, and not share those necessarily. Uh, we probably have a better feel than a written understanding. Meaning if you were to ask certain managers, put a crew together to go to Mars, I think we'd, we'd have a pretty good idea who to put there. Now, can I demonstrate on paper exactly all the metrics we use? Probably not. Uh, but I would say with, with a fair degree of confidence that we could choose a crew of six individuals uh, and probably have a 95% solution to head off on a three-year DRM to, to Mars. My point of view. My mad. <laughs> As a psychologist, mm -hmm. I I don't have uh, ninety five percent sure and evidence. Maybe because I'm different person from Mike, but Shock. but uh, let's take annual flight or three three hundred forty days flight. Uh, there were several periods uh, for the crew. Some periods were good. Some were not. And that was due to the changes in crew composition during the flight. If you look uh, who were visiting and staying, you can define where there were problems and when they were not. So with this person, everything was fine. With, you add that person and it changes. Uh, next day, I'm going to speak about Sirius. Sirius uh, is uh, not just a bitch on my... Uh, on my clothes, but it's uh, the idea or, or concept how to find the ideal crew uh, taking into consideration we are going to have free women and free men for the first time in the history of Russian space psychology. The point is, what is the right combination? Not who is the individual crew member. From that point, I accept the concept of Mike. I think that f from, from the individual point of selection, we know whom to select. But we do not know how to select proper crew, how to distribute uh, responsibilities yet, and we even do not know how, what will be the perfect size of the hermetic volume the, uh, if we take into consideration the relationship which is changeable during the flight. Okay, okay. Uh, it's my, my best example. I'm speaking about the, the family. You hate your wife, you can't live with her, you divorce, you leave her, and you are happy. You, and you are the same person, by the way, genetically the same. Unhappy, happy. You fly with one person, then with another, and it's absolutely different crew, and you are still good. And he is still good, or she, but the combination is bad. And that is the problem. The longer the mission is, as you say, the more it's, it's important. 
Mike asked me, what kind of flights I want? I want flights longer than three months, that's for sure. Because with, for three months, I can marry anybody and live with her, and probably she also can. But for six months, it's a different story. For one year, it's, 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 it's a trial. And that means that we are good in individual selection, probably. But definitely, we are not good in crew selection for the long period of time. That's the answer. <laughs> On the anecdotal aspect, I would like to add that in my experience, the real crisis which occurred were actually triggered by interaction with the co with the ground, yep. and uh, the the impact of the uh, the ground control on the crew which is stable can on, should not be underestimated. Yep. Yeah, that's for, that's why we're having content space experiment where we analyze the communication of the crew with mission control. And uh, that's good for me that our American colleagues now get interested in that, our Japanese colleagues and even Chinese. So they are trying to investigate the same stuff. And it turned out that the style of communication <coughs> in the autonomous flight and in the long flight should be different from the style of communication in the short flight. And uh, a lot of things depend on the proper style of communication of mission controllers. And I'm not mentioning the uh, proper information or improper information, good recommendations or bad recommendations. I mean the style of communication. And uh, the longer they fly, the more I hear, you do not understand what is going on here and trying to, to recommend me what to do. And that's the answer. Again, uh, a lot of problems are not resolved despite we're happy now. Yeah. And by the way, I forgot to mention, one of my crewmates is Koichi Wakata. So we, we flew, what, five months together-ish? Four and a half, five months? Yeah, so just uh, someone who can corroborate my story. We <laughs> <laughs> want that much of an outlier. We have a question back. So uh, it seems to me that, uh, uh, at least Vadim has the approach kind of typical uh, wrong approach, I think, when it comes to design, that you, you have to design optimally and not design to good enough. I, I mean, you just need a crew which is good enough to make the mission. You don't need to have the perfect crew can survive and do it, be happily living together as a Christmas family for, for the whole, this whole time. And uh, if I understand Mike more, uh, assuming we had a spaceship was technologically ready and safe, could go on this uh, at least one and a half year mission with a month at Mars, uh, and maybe even have radiation sold, I mean, wouldn't we be able to find a crew more or less tomorrow to go? So I would say that depends on who you ask. Um, if well, it seemed that you said yes, and Vadim said no. I so want to have I a little bit more discussion. I, I didn't say no. I, I believe I the said I don't yes. know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I agree with Dr. Gushin that I probably can't tell you the perfect crew tomorrow, but I could probably assemble three crews from international crew members based on their flight experience individually and as crew and team members. Um, that uh, three crews of six, I would say, that could successfully pull off a one and a half year design reference mission. Now, successfully doesn't mean everybody comes back like the Waltons or, uh, uh, you know, necessarily mm -hmm. the, the perfect happy family, but we are here to support the mission. And our mission will never be based primarily on the psychological makeup of the crew. It will be all skill sets, who can push the right button, what level of expertise and technical support we need to be distributed among that crew, and a certain professionalism that calibrates the expectation of that crew. Those are the big important factors. Uh, can that work? Yes, we know that it can, because when you look back in uh, exploration venues, what was successful, sure, they, they did it. They did their mission. They weren't all really happy families. Uh, let me add a little bit to the answer. Uh, I understand what you mean. They must not be happy, and uh, nobody is taking care, actually, about their happiness for now. But uh, it's like in sport. In the best uh, teams, uh, the relationship is not perfect, but they are good. Because under stress, every single factor can increase its importance. If you do not trust your crew member, your teammate, 
despite the level of qualification, you will not do the job. So it's not only about qualification. That's it. But of course, you're absolutely right. Nobody's taking care about their happiness, even them. Tim. Yeah, Mike. Uh, you know, after five shuttle flights and a long duration mission, only about half the people that I flew with would I be willing to get on a spaceship and go to Mars with. Uh, and nobody knows that. Nobody knows who those people are, except everybody knows I love Yuri Usachov and Susan <laughs> Howells. But other than that, no one knows who the, the other half are that I would not fly with. And I contend that it's really hard for management to know without going to extreme means. And I, I think Vadim points out very well that we don't know for sure who will be compatible for a long time and I do believe that compatibility and getting along with and loving your crewmates is essential for true success on a flight you can you can fly and spend a week with anybody in space but I would suffer deeply with some of the people that I spent a week with if I had to spend a year with them in space and I think that's very hard for people to know and and you may even know well, as I do, that there have been people who have flown together, said they'd never fly with that person again, yeah. got assigned again because nobody asked after the flight, how'd you do, how'd you get along? And maybe they're, they're doing better today, but no one ever asked me, who would I fly with again? Who did I like to fly with again? It was all pretty arbitrary by management. And I, maybe you can enlighten us a little bit on what's being done to ensure that we do get people who at least won't kill each other before they come home. Well, I can never assure that, but uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I can assure you though that things are radically different from the time you guys were assigned. And that uh, translates into everything from the flight assignments to the prep. Right now, it's an expectation that we choose people, we send them off to training venues, and you do rate your peers. And among the questions are, would you, would you fly with this person? Uh, would you, how would you rate this person's um, action on this venue, whether it's the, uh, gosh, the sea kayaking trips or, or on Nemo? I mean, I had to do these, we all do it. We rate one another as peers, uh, and that has led to some people not flying. Um, and in general, you go in with that uh, mindset so that you're, you're trying to make everybody succeed, but, but you know that's a possible outcome. But mostly, it, it forces you to figure out ways to make the team succeed. So, boy, it's been, what, 15 years since you flew, yeah? Uh, things are much better. There's no question about it. Yeah, that's true. In, in, in our agency, it's also the asking them. The question is that sometimes they take this into consideration, sometimes not. And uh, of course, technical issues are more important. If you are more ready for this particular mission, if you are better in some operations which are really necessary for the mission success, of course you will fly. And again, nobody will die because you do not like your partner. But it will not be that smooth and easy. And the level of stress will be higher. And the person will be uh, under pressure. And the question is, we are now having short flights, comparatively short. What if the flights will be longer? That's the question. But to, to that, I would counter that the, as a crew surgeon, the biggest negative crew interactions I saw were on shuttle flights, by far. Maybe I can ex relate to also to what is done on the um, Franco-Italian um, uh, Antarctic station in Concordia. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a station which is co-managed by two different countries, which is purely scientific, and they, are, they really have difficulties to recruit crew members for participating in, in their winter over. When they, when they call for a selection, they receive almost a matching number of candidates for the position which are open, so there is n very little t choice uh, for selection. And uh, for a very long time, they had just taken the, the crew members, sent, shipped them to Antarctica, got them back six months later, and hoping everything was going well during that time. Uh, Concordia is even worse than the, the polar station in the, uh, of the U.S. That's, something, that's a place where you have absolutely no possibility to evacuate some, to someone in the, in the winter. So that's, uh, for me, one of very, very good analog to, uh, to an exploration mission. There have been a few times where there were incidents during, uh, during the winter where, which were really borderline to the major crisis. Um, they came to us and asked us if we could help them uh, 
make a better selection, which proved not being possible, but also to make some kind of training for the crew because it was not done before. <coughs> the best we could implement, that's about a one week training before they were shipped to Antarctica. During, the, during this, we, we, this single week of training, we, we try to at least sensibilize them uh, to uh, how to manage difficult psychological situation. It has saved at least one winter over, and in another case, we could at least pick out a crew member which was completely uh, out of scope. But uh, it's only six months, or a bit more than six months, eight, uh, going up to eight months. But that's something where really we, are, we really have no uh, possibility for exit. If, we, if it had gone to, for a longer duration, for a longer mission, I do I currently not yet sure how these people could manage. Mm -hmm. So I think we are here in a situation which is, uh, for exploration mission, pretty much analog. And we have to be very careful on the way we select, but also on the way we train. And that's also, uh, I really like the way the Russians, uh, my Russian colleague did it uh, for, long, uh, for, for many years, which is to have a long uh, two years training for the complete crew to at least stabilize the relationship <coughs> between the crew members and evaluate also how the interaction was going on. I think that's a concept which has not just to be thrown away, that's really something which has to be kept. Question over there. Yeah, I, uh, I just simulated 10,000 one-year mission programs on my computer. <laughs> uh, I can do that much cheaper than NASA can do it. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just 15 lines of code. Uh, and actually, I, ma I made the assumption that one out of 10 astronauts would develop a space adaptation syndrome, whatever we may call it, something serious during a one-year mission. Now, if you only have two astronauts, what, that's the status where we are right now, you actually have a 81.3% chance of missing that syndrome by just selecting the wrong two guys. And that chance decreases to 28.1% if you have 12 astronauts. I just thought that that was like, of course you can change the numbers, you can, you know, if the prevalence is 20% or 5%, these numbers will change, but just gives you an idea what, you know, increasing the number was, the, what that means for, for detecting anything serious. So really a question, it's just, you know, I just made this game here and I thought it was, what sure. it was an interesting piece of information. Well, occasionally, you know, we all know models are helpful, but mostly wrong. <laughs> Every day he predicts the weather in Philadelphia and whether the lights will go out in the building. And <laughs> just That's like the best job ever, you get paid to be wrong. <laughs> I guess uh, my question's for the panel as, as a whole. I wonder if you have the wrong paradigm for this one-year mission. And by that I mean everything has been optimized as much as possible, mm -hmm. whether it's the exercise protocols or the nutrition, et cetera. Now, you made the comment, I think Mike made it, that uh, repeating the menu every eight days was a really bad thing. Uh, that was not my comment. I was fine oh, with I'm that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mike will eat anything. Got, uh, okay. Well, what about the fact that you've optimized exercise? I mean, I started working on that in 1990, and, and actually, actually in Skylab. Mm -hmm. And now it's pretty good. You've got a pretty good approach, good equipment. You can't fit any of that in an Orion spacecraft. So when are you going to fly somebody for six months or a year with no exercise and the same nutrition every week and the conditions that will actually exist on the mission that we're talking about? Yeah, so to be clear, we, we consider that very seriously when we started uh, whacking out the, the parameters of the one-year flight. Uh, at the extreme, we would have had a smaller module that those two crew members would have been confined to. We would have simulated a progressive time delay uh, and probably a regressive uh, time delay at the other end of that. We would have limited exercise to something that was commensurate with what we could have thrown to Mars. We actually did think about that. Uh, the disruption of the station program by taking two workers off the line because we're really there in that low earth platform to produce science uh, and the disruption on the rest of the platform really tipped the balance of that equation the wrong way. So it was a serious consideration, uh, but it is something you might consider doing more towards the end of your station program for exactly those reasons you mentioned. Because now you have the best case. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I will be the first to tell you that living on station right now, it's, it's never been easier to live in space which is good because they expect a lot of work out of you. But. 
I think if we put the uh, the one year mission in the in the perspective of exploration, that's probably true. That there is a lot of paradigms that we have to reconsider and exactly exercise is one of them. How far can we let p someone not exercise? in order to facilitate the operations or reduce the, uh, the resources consumption and, uh, and up to what level can we let him go down before it's, going, it's being too late and we cannot catch him back to the normal afterward. But that's also something which is related to the mission profile and what has to be performed during the, uh, during the, the mission at the end if there is a landing in a, in a, in an, uh, on Mars, by example. There is an operational success level which is required uh, how can we be sure that the, the people which will not train enough can reach that level when they are going there? And that's something which is currently unknown. I do you think that we have to uh, take that factor as no training? Uh, again, I'm reading the talks, everyday talks of the crew. They always want to train, and if they prevent from training for some issues, maybe some other job or uh, equipment is not working perfectly, they really suffer from that. They want more, and uh, they will not substitute training with anything else. They take it not as a, only a physiological factor, but as a psychological factor. So again, I, I, I do not expect them to train less. Yeah, absolutely right. One point I'd like to bring up is, um, in addition to our flight one-year missions, we also will have concurrent analog um, isolation missions to look at the behavioral effects. And that's what our colleagues at IBMP and NASA will be uh, starting actually on uh, this coming Tuesday with their upcoming Sirius 17 mission. So we'll be flying to Moscow right after this <laughs> meeting. Uh, but yes, one of the things and the points of what kind of stressors can you add um, to a crew, whether it's smaller volume, lack of exercise, limited food, uh, limited food menu. Those are the things that we would probably uh, look at in more of an analog environment and closed environment. Dr. Smith, did you have something to add? Yeah, a couple of things. One, um, sort of tying into Dr. Dinge's comment before and, and going up here is to Chuck. Again, when we when we look at repeat flyers, um, many times, many many aspects of the mission have changed. Exercise devices, exercise availability, the food system itself, many different things. Countermeasure studies that they were participating in that are different between two flights. So even when we're looking at the same individual on two different missions, you don't know if it's just the fact that they're flying a second time. Um, with regard to the, the one-year mission, I, I think I'm allowed to say both these things. Um, I remember before the flight talking to Scott at one point about, you know, showing him our exercise data that, you know, people that exercised hard with the A-RED that had good nutritional status, maintained their body weight, didn't lose bone. Um, and this was, again, before his 12-month mission, and his comment was that he wasn't sure he was going to be able to sustain that level of exercise for that amount of time. Um, the other is, I'm told, in his book, which I haven't read and I'm not advocating sales of, um, that he commented that at one point he pulled something halfway through the mission, um, which, which hindered his ability to exercise. So there are aspects of that that you can go in and look at the data to try to tease around that. Um, and, and again, it gets back to that. You, you're really looking at, you know, we have data on, on 75 crew members, but it's really 75 case studies. Dr. Roberts. Um, what about con conditions that don't plateau? So, for example, I've been studying the dip issue, and um, in the longest cruise that I've seen, there's no evidence of any type of plateau. And we have no evidence um, or data concerning whether or not um, Earth's one gravity will remediate that. And can we assume that um, that's going to be okay? Take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<clears throat> Shameless advertising. Dr. Roberts did have a landmark study published in the New England <laughs> Journal of Medicine just a couple of days ago on her MRI work with uh, vision and cranial pressure. It was really good. So you should read that, uh, even if you don't subscribe to it. So uh, first thing, I would challenge your assumption that there are no plateaus. Um, there are plateaus. Some of them happen really early in the mission. Some of the more profound changes associated with spaceflight, as you're aware, plasma volume, RBC, uh, down regulation. Um, your cardiovascular system gets set. We have a much better characterization of that over long duration now. Right. And so what you, you may, we didn't know about VIP until just a few years ago. There's probably other VIPs out there that we haven't seen before. So you will have to go with a certain uncertainty that there are things that you haven't seen, but are you operating in a tolerable, acceptable range or not? Uh, so that's really where we are. Uh, the best, again, you do pay penalties. Uh, and when I came down, I, I had pretty good bone, not 100%. I knew I was probably not going to get back on my, my curve, so to speak, uh, per age. But am I acceptable and functional in, in the 1G environment? Yeah, uh, I think the answer is yes. And so I think we have to extrapolate that out to whatever planetary surface we think we're going to and then coming back and, and living out our lives after that. So are we in an acceptable range or not? So, sure, some of the plateaus we know. I think Bone is showing us a plateau, right? So, I mean, things that we didn't think were going to plateau are showing us that they are with the long-duration studies. So they are they're showing us these things. Um, but I don't think we should ever kid ourselves that... I'm sorry? I don't think we should kid ourselves that, um, that we're going to recognize all of those before we decide to go. Yeah? Me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I think that it will be better... If you will operate the data, which are known and already uh, proved, you know, the first of all, uh, for uh, first period of flight, it is known that uh, when the first flight started and they were without uh, countermeasure, then when they came up, they were increasing the duration of flight very slowly, and not by one, one by one, but by group of people. And when they came to the duration of complete unloading during 17 days, people needed very acute rehabilitation. And there was discussed by the whole community, Russian and American, at that time, at the very beginning. That's why I said, that's what you need old people for. You know, <laughs> they still know it. That it was found that 70 days, 17 days without thread, without uh, uh, countermeasure, physical exercises, incomplete unloading, will give you the uh, state close that you will lose your cosmonaut. And that was discussed. There was accepted the all, all world conclusion that 17 days are the uh, longest, uh, longest uh, uh, flight longest without countermeasure. Then later, it was tested in many, many. Let's talk because you keep talking. And of course, I'm sitting and feel somehow that I don't understand where I am. Because a lot of experiment, thousands, the same as in the, your area in which you are working, were performed on the ground, in flight, and so on and so on, using a lot of different approaches to test the situation, and it was shown that actually you can fly it in big, sh in big uh, ships like uh, the uh, uh, ships which were used, like our station and so on, longer than 17 days. You can l uh, fly up to 30 days, but uh, the person will come bad, but Okay, not what's surviving. Mm. If the ship was big and a lot of working activity occurred, 
not special, not physical exercises, but just that he is walking and microgravity diminish when he is walking and station is moving and so on and so on. You can bring him home alive when you, he doesn't exercise up to 30 days, but he will come back in very bad condition and I can describe to you these conditions. So that's the next one. Now, the point is that later on, uh, the, he became more sensitive. He, I say, in spite of the fact that what was told today is that everything is so different and so on and so on. Maybe everybody is different, but everybody need, everybody who was raised in gravitational situation, he needs the loading to be alive. If he'll be not loading for certain amount of time, he will come to the case, to the moment when his muscle system will atrophy. And additionally to this, the system of uh, supporting the muscle system. It means heart, the breathing, our vegetative uh, control system, and so on and so on. They will be not able to keep you alive. That's it, that's shown. And what is bad, that we have, unfortunately, oh, it, was, it was not a special experiment, experiment, but unfortunately, when you fly one the cosmonaut after the other for long, for long time, for months, then you meet the situation when our training, training devices are uh, go off, or the cosmonaut goes off. He cannot, he just cannot. And it is not experiment. We are not allowed to perform such experiment, but we collect this situation, which occur in spite of our <laughs> wish or non-wish. And I will tell you that that's why Vadim told you, he said that Cosmonaut, when we talk to them, when we need time, and we say that tomorrow we have to schedule something, they said, oh no, that's my exercise time. Do you think that they like sports so much? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> they sometimes, they don't like this lesson so much that they, they don't hate, no, no, they don't like, they hate us because they somehow automatically bring it from training devices to us. <laughs> that we are guilty that they have to work there, you know, so hard and so on and so on. And uh, nevertheless, we had enough cases when our training devices were out and the and cosmonaut couldn't work uh, in physical exercises by 10, 12, 14, or even close to months time. And this is very hard time for them, very hard. And even more hard after that, because I remember the uh, situation. Now I can't even say the name. This is Serioja Volk mm -hmm. and Kananenko. Yeah. When they, they were a first flyer, so I explained to them before flight that, look, guys, you should do this, 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 this. But if you will not do it, believe me, you will pass 10 days. But after these 10 days during flight, you will have very hard time to regain it back. And they listened to me. And then it happened. For two weeks, the treadmill didn't work. And after two weeks, they came back to the treadmill. They couldn't run. And from that time, I'm the most popular person <laughs> in their eyes. They said, see, Inessa told so that you will be not able to run. And we cannot, so we have to train again. So the uh, performance 
we climb very, very, very fast in weightlessness. That is not our, you know, <laughs> that's the fact which is proved very much. But, but one more thing I wanted to add to your uh, discussion of selection. I agree completely with Michael, who said that, of course, psychology is extremely important. But we, but we and you, American and the other, select people not only and sometimes just not on psychology at all, but on, on the task which cosmonaut should perform during flight, uh, on uh, many other things which we know, which we foresee for them in fly. And I wanted to say that psychology is extremely important. But thanks God that psychology we can foresee and we can teach because psychology something which is learned. But there is some proper, our property which cannot be learned, really learned. And one of these, just another case. We had a case when we lost our cosmonaut completely. Not, 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 not dead, but cosmonaut. The person who wanted to be cosmonaut, and he could be more, maybe good cosmonaut, but we lost him. Why? He was flying. Everything was OK. Uh, he was on monitoring. Monitoring showed that everything was OK. And then some stressful situation occurred. Very, very much stressful. <coughs> and the person gave something like heart attack. And he couldn't train after that on treadmill. He could train, but not he showed us on test that he couldn't run fast. But we know that if he wouldn't run fast, that's, that's the end. He, he cannot fly. So we kept him for more than once, trying to rehab. Nothing helped. And we landed him. And his career was over. On the ground, he was in hospital. They didn't find anything bad with his heart. Could you imagine how he liked us after that? And, but that was the end. But later, when we tried, and we not tried, but we analyzed the case together with medical people, uh, testing many things and so on. And then we invited for consultation also people from sport. And we got the answer which we tested, and we agreed that they were absolutely right. They said that according to your uh, tests, and we provided a lot of tests with the man after he's coming back. They said, you know, there are people who are born systemically, like system. They are born like sprinter. And the other are born like stars. In sprinter, and we know that's what sports people explain to us. They said that we are working with selection of people for sport. For sport, you know. And we know it. People who are born for, as sprinters, they have different muscles, absolutely, and different system of reactivity. It is systemic response. Sprinter responds to load, any load, through stress system immediately, like this. You know it. Anaerobic 
response in muscle, heart, 200 immediately, and so on and so on. And he's ready, everything's down, but he cannot stay for a long time with loading. Styre's just on the opposite. You give him load, he's going like this. And he will stay for months. And that's it. So they said, you should add the battery of test for reactivity, for stress, and select people for long-term flight, sprinters, and your brave man, excellent man, excellent pilot, as a matter of fact. He was, he came to this. He was a sprinter. So, but again, and even this selection is not the only one. Because we know that there are different organizations of muscle system which will give you different adaptation curve. That's what you talked about, Michael, and so on and so on. So I think, on, I never, uh, it was not my field, selection. But of course, I watch it, and we follow the results of wrong selection, like in this example which I gave you. And therefore, I say that if we came now to selection of very important area, important fields for international uh, and for flights, long-term flight and so on, selection is one of the field. Thank you. Thanks, Inessa Benedict. Do we have another question? Well, thank you very much for those insights. I mean, I think we'll have a continuing discussion on the one-year missions, their design, the science that would be selected to go in the, into them. Um, so we expect a, a much more robust conversation as we go through a variety of different venues. I want to thank, thank you to the panel for all their uh, contributions today and their insights. And uh, I think we're ready for a break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.